So my friends, last night we left off with an overview of the way of the beginner, the way of prayer and renunciation according to St. John of the Cross. We saw how fidelity to this path opens the door to contemplation, a new type of encounter with God, which is, well, actually now on the experiential level and transcends meditation, which focuses on the intellectual deliberation of the mysteries of God. Contemplation also transcends the sweet feelings that the beginner often experiences in the initial walk with the Lord, not just maybe with the first conversion or the second conversion, but with, with even months, sometimes years after that, there's, there's these sweet experiences in prayer which begin to fade. All of these are substance, the substance of the first stage of the spiritual life, which you know, so we call the beginner or the pur period of pur purgation. So just to give you an illustration of what I'm talking about, if you're familiar with, perhaps you use them when you, when you meditate. Uh, if you have ever seen the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola or the introduction to the devout life by St. Francis de Sales, they have these set prescribed meditations, a point of, points of meditation, passages from scripture to read and so forth, leading the person who is meditating this mental prayer through the meditation and then coming to some kind of a conclusion like a resolution to perform certain acts of charity or virtue going forward. So, but that's all right with the mind. You're deliberating, you're thinking, you are discoursing in your mind about these beautiful points of the faith. Then, and it's very structured, right? But now, the soul, as the soul matures, there arrives a new moment when that mental prayer, which emphasizes that the working of the mind becomes fruitless. It just doesn't produce the same kind of experiences before and gradually the meditation becomes characterized more and more by a loving conversation with the Lord in which sure there's a little bit of thinking but then the soul moves into a an apprehension an appreciation understanding of God's love and there becomes less and less reasoning more and more direct experience of God as the person opens his heart, he basks in that presence of the Lord. Eventually, contemplation comes to dominate a person's spiritual life, and the transition into contemplation is a divine grace. You can't force it. It doesn't happen by techniques. You know, if you, if you thought that you could go to some place where you learn how to meditate, and that's what makes it happen, no, it's a sheer grace from the person being open, having denied themselves and been faithful to, the, to, the, uh, to prayer and the spiritual life, the grace comes. You can't mandate it, you can't force it to happen, but it will come as a grace from heaven. Father Gabriel of St. Mary Magdalene says that to enjoy contemplation is not the same as going into ecstasy. It is simply beginning to know God no longer with the intellect, but through the experience of love that gives us a sense of his greatness. Many persons imagine, imagine contemplation to be something extraordinary, confounding it with visions and revelations and all kinds of these uh, mystical phenomena, and believe that it makes one see clearly into the divine mysteries. I repeat that it is not a question of this, but of a new knowledge of God, which is rather of an experiential nature in which the principal part is held by love and that forcefully attaches itself to God and thus gets from it a particular sense, a certain experience of God. So when, when the soul, when a person begins to experience that contemplation and that, that now that, you know, the, the rolling, mulling over of these mysteries in my mind, it's just, it's frustrating to me. It's, it's kind of, uh, 
you know, it's, it's very dry. And they realize now they're moving into contemplation. They should just really set aside that kind of meditation and stay completely with contemplation. Now, as the soul moves into that, that breathing of God and contemplation, there's a parallel experience that happens with that. And now we're, now we're into the second stage, the stage of the illumination, the way of the illumination. And so as the person experiences this prayer of the quiet, this, this uh, contemplative dimension, it enters into a painful crisis, a crisis. The signals arrive, and this signals the arrival of the period or way of the illumination, which St. John of the Cross describes as the dark night of the soul, that famous phraseology associated with St. John of the Cross, the dark night of the soul. This is the experience that he is famous for. The first aspect of the dark night is what St. John of the Cross calls the dark night of the sense. Because it concerns the purification of our senses, the five senses, which of course are wounded by original sin and need to be purified if we're going to have unity with God. And so this dark night of the sense is a passive experience. You, you, you can't force it, you can't make it happen. It doesn't matter how many times you scourge yourself, it can't force it to happen. But it will happen if we surrender ourselves to it and experience it passively. And so the soul undergoes trials given to it directly by God, directly by God, which always, the penances that God sends are always superior, as you know, to what we choose for ourselves. The soul has gone as far as it possibly can through its own efforts of mortification, mortification and meditation. You reach, you know, you reach the, the wall, if you will. And now it, it has to be God or it's not going to happen. Now it's God's work of purgation upon the soul, burning away the dross of sensual attachments. Although this is a passive process in which God operates directly on the soul by his grace, we have to nevertheless cooperate with it by enduring, accepting, and surrendering ourselves to this painful purification. That's why he calls it a dark night. We have to remain steadfast in our fidelity to our spiritual exercises and to renunciation. The principal experience of this dark night or this dark night of the sense, the first phase is aridity. Here God is tearing away attachments and we cannot of ourselves, that we could not of ourselves have separated. We could not have shed them. We could not have expunged them from our souls, from our person, from it's God's divine grace at that point. And so the pleasure of the spiritual life is suppressed. Prayer becomes obscure and cold. It seems that the soul cannot make any contact with God at all. Where are you, Lord? Where are you? And all the previous approaches that used to, used to fuel the soul and give it its consolations of what they, they are no longer providing it. And so it becomes almost like a futile effort from our end. The spiritual life has changed into a dark, hard winter. Now the soul keeps a continual remembrance of God, but even that remembrance is kind of painful because I can't, I can't get to him or he doesn't come to me, but I still remember those experiences of God and I have him in my mind and yet he seems to be eluding me. I think about him, but he's not there for me. This apparent regression hides a new elevation of the soul, a new threshold that is crossing. Now the assumption here is that people haven't backslidden, they haven't 
stopped making efforts in the spiritual life. They haven't stopped trying to be virtuous and so forth. They haven't stopped trying to live a life of humility and sacrifice for others. So the excruciating aridity, if it, it can come from, if we backslide, if we give up, and then it wouldn't be the sign of going into the second, the second uh, phase of the spiritual life, the illumination. But if we have entered into contemplation, if we're experiencing this dryness, deep aridity, and we're remembering God and haven't slackened our spiritual life, we are now entering in to this preparatory period for union with God, which we call the dark night. And there's other, there's other things that can happen during this uh, spiritual experience. Now neither the world, it's like being caught between two dimensions of aridity. All the things that used to satisfy us in the worldly experiences, I'm not talking about bad things, I'm talking about good things. They lost their edge, they don't have the appeal anymore. And the spiritual life has no real satisfaction. And so there's this, this sense of abandonment. Where, who am I, where am I? The things I used to have fun doing, enjoy doing, not that they're bad, they just don't do it, they don't satisfy me anymore. That's why you hear sometimes of these these saints who maybe had particular talents and gifts, they just give them up. You say, how could you do that? I just lost it. I lost my interest in it. It doesn't do it for me anymore. And so God has turned all everything into a darkness for the soul. Everything. St. John of the Cross describes the night of the senses in, in these terms. God leaves such souls so completely in the dark that they cannot advance a single step as they were wont to do before their inward senses, before, as they used to, were wont to do before. Their inward senses being submerged in this night and left with such dryness that not only do they experience no pleasure and consolation in spiritual things and good exercises wherein they were wont to find their delights and pleasures, but instead, on the contrary, they find insipidity and bitterness in the said things. For as I have said, God now, lay us, God now sees that they have grown a little and are becoming strong enough to lay aside their swaddling clothes and be taken from the gentle breast. So he sets them down in his arms and teaches from his arms and teaches them to walk on their own feet, which they feel to be very strange for everything seems to be going wrong with them. While it seems like we are lose, losing God, it's precisely that we are maturing in Christ in this moment. There's other trials that can and do accompany the night of the sense. It's not uncommon for a person to experience exterior trials as well, like the misfortunes in property and in employment and in natural things, loss of good reputation, disturbances with family and friends, all kinds of severe temptations. Now external, internal, everything seems to be falling to pieces in a person's life. And sometimes we associate that with some kind of a psychological event, but if we're people in prayer and we're faithful, God is doing some great work within us. St. John of the Cross notes another common trial here. One may be able to find a spiritual guide to assist in these ordeals, or one may feel that a spiritual director does not truly understand the state of his or her soul. Left alone, left alone. God's left me, nobody understands me. As everything crumbles around the soul, it may attempt to cling says John of the Cross to his or her spiritual director as a lifeline in an unhealthy way, desiring attention, a particular friendship, or to be a favorite. 
And he says, all these attachments must be purified, purified painfully. In these afflictions, the soul must abandon itself to God without reservation. And unfortunately, this is where most people say, I've had enough. Thank you, Lord, but no thank you. You know, it's like St. Teresa of Avila said, Lord, if this is the way you treat your, your favorites, uh, I don't know if I really want to be one. St. John of the Cross states in the dark night of the soul that there are very few who endure and persevere entering by this straight gate and by the narrow way which leads to life as our Savior, as says our Savior. The straight gate is this night of the sense and the soul detaches itself from sense and strips itself thereof that it may enter by this gate and establishes itself in faith, which is a stranger to all sense. In faith, which is a stranger to all sense. In other words, we live by faith, not by sight. We see nothing but darkness, feel nothing. We live by faith. That's the perfection of faith. That's faith being purified and honed. So that afterwards it may, be, it may journey by the narrow way, which is the other night, that of the spirit. We'll talk about that in a moment. And this, the soul afterwards enters in order to journey to God in pure faith, which is the means whereby the soul is united to God. So in this general crisis, St. John of the Cross says, the soul is infused with divine love. Infused, in other words, God is emptying himself into that soul. It's coming directly from heaven and it begins to be born in a new way. Greater charity flows forth from that soul. Growth in self-knowledge and humility, a spirit of resignation more deeply rooted all these things are more deeply rooted in the soul. It's a consequence of being this transformation in Jesus Christ that's taking place within a person. It becomes more and more like the Lord. St. John of the Cross presents this paradox of feeling abandoned by God, yet actually advancing in these terms. This night and purification of the appetite is full of happiness to the soul involving great benefits, though it seems as if all were lost. So, the paradox is, I lose myself in Jesus, I find myself. I lose everything and I gain everything. If the soul should persevere through this agonizing journey, it's on the pathway to profound unity with God. But it's, yes, it, but the purification process is not complete yet. It's hard to believe after all of that. Subsequently, perhaps after many years, the soul, persevering in prayer and renunciation, the soul enters into the dark night of the spirit. So now that the senses have been purified by this, by this experience of the dark night, of the sense. Now the higher faculties of the soul need to be purified. And this process is even, well, no more challenging. Very few Christians will persevere to that degree. It's like a purgatory on earth the second night, what is called the night of the spirit. So the first night purified and raised the soul to higher stratums by reordering and rectifying the senses, subjecting them to the dominance of the Holy Spirit. Now, in the second night, the night of the spirit, the higher faculties of the soul are healed and harmonized. The intellect, the memory, the imagination, the reason, the judgment and will 
which of course have all been wounded by original sin. Could think that one could be so purified, right? Wouldn't it be wonderful that even our memories, our imaginations would be so under God that be almost like a, a foretaste of before the fall. Have dreams at night, only beautiful things. St. John of the Cross describes this purgation. God strips their faculties, affections, and feelings, both spiritual and sensible, both outward and inward, leaving the understanding dark, the will dry, the memory empty, and the affections in the deepest affliction, bitterness, and constraint, taking from the soul the pleasure and experience of spiritual blessings which it had aforetime, in order to make of this privation one of the principles which are requisite in the union of love. So that great third stage can only be attained passing through this experience. But an important point, because I would, it'll, it'll refer to something from last, last night. John O'Cross says that this dark night is an inflowing of God into the soul which purges it from its ignorances and imperfections, habitual, natural, and spiritual, and which is called by contemplatives, infused contemplation or mystical theology. So while last night we were speaking about mysticism as being the, the uh, you know, the, the stigmata of Padre Pio or the scent of roses coming from holy people or holy objects or the, uh, the uh, apparitions and audible words of God spoken to us, all those things right we were speaking about. Mystical theology for John of the Cross is this transformation that occurs traveling through the way of purgation, the way of illumination to union and that is mystical because it's coming from heaven. It is an infused, divinely infused gift. So it's not anything that anybody can obtain through their own efforts, except that to dispose ourselves as has been described here. So it's a mysticism in the true sense that everybody can touch, taste, possibly experience if they are gonna go all the way. Father Gabriel explains that the dark night of the spirit has the effect of uniting the soul ever closer with God. The darkness or pain one experiences in the purgation is not the, owing to the absence of God, but to his proximity. He's so close at that point. The blindness of the soul is not caused by an absence of light, but by the superabundance of light. Overwhelmed by God and not even aware of it can't discern it because it's not in the feelings. The will of the person is torturously brought into unity with the will of God, which is what love is, right? Love is a unity of wills between two people. I will do what you want. You want to do what I want. That's the essence of love. So not on an emotional level of anybody been married some years, they know that. There's, There's aspects to it, but In the end, it's, do you will to love or not? So this dark night of the spirit is a passive experience wherein God's grace acts directly upon the soul and the soul passively accepts the purifying fire. Practically speaking, the love of God means to adhere in such a complete way to his will so as to lose our will in his. Jesus, in fact, said this was a condition for discipleship. In Luke chapter 9, he says, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Also, almost verbatim found in Mark and Matthew's Gospels. 
In this passage, to the conformity of love, the feelings are of little account. The sweet emotions of the spiritual life are not the substance of union with God. That's a confusing point for most folks. The door is now open for total union because the soul has been forced from all attachments. The fruits of this transforming spiritual grace are an increase in the virtues of charity, humility, joy, peace, patience, generosity, right judgment, compassion, and precision in the exercise of uh, the duties of our state in life. All of this propels the soul onward to its desired goal, perfect union with, union with God. In fact, if, we, if his soul was passing through these dark nights and did not have that goal in mind of union with God, he could never, if he never thought, like, I'm doing this for one reason, to be united with God, he could never endure it. The perfect the perfection of the soul's fusion, fusion, fusion with God is termed by St. John of the Cross as the mystical marriage or the transforming union. He uses this nuptial theme or imager as a metaphor for the highest and most exalted state of the spiritual life. So that's, that's strong stuff, my friends. I know that's strong stuff. The dark night of the soul is a little bit overwhelming. It's a little bit, a little bit intense, a little bit uh, maybe daunting, right? Whew. But tomorrow night we're going to take a look at the mystical marriage described by St. John of the Cross. What happens when you finally get through that passage and the graces that come and along with that a little secret little secret of the spiritual life.